Hello, hello, and welcome to another one of my KSP2 videos. Now, uh, I've been playing KSP2 for nearly 200 hours now, and honestly at least 150 of those hours has been spent uh, basically reinventing SSTO technology. Now I've been a huge fan of uh, SSTOs in KSP1, and honestly I love them even more in KSP2. But uh, looking through forums and Discord, I do see a lot of people struggling with, with SSTOs, as well as some other fellow YouTubers that were uh, very good at SSTOs in KSP1. So I decided to share my knowledge, knowledge. and hopefully help you guys out uh, with your SSTO designs. Engine choice. Now, based on my testing, I've discovered that there are realistically only two uh, efficient engine choices. The first one is the classic, the pure rapier design. I would definitely suggest going for a pure rapier design for someone that is maybe new to KSP or new to KSP2 even, and wants something that is a little bit more simplistic. Personally in my testing I've been able to get as much as 3000 LKO Delta V with a pure rapier design, so there's definitely plenty of potential in, in it. I've also experimented with a mixed uh, rapier and dedicated uh, chemical vacuum engines, but honestly, based on my testing, I don't think it's that worth it. In theory, you can get approximately 10% more Delta V if you include a uh, dedicated vacuum engine, specifically the Poodle, but uh, that's like 10% at, at the best of times. You need to... You basically need to optimize the hell out of the SSTO to see any uh, real benefits from having a dedicated vacuum engine, and honestly, you're more likely to uh, hurt your Delta V rather than help it. The reason for that is because the Poodle has very low thrust, which greatly limits how much it can actually lift out of uh, out of the atmosphere. Now, I did experiment with the Labradoodle engine. But based on my testing, I found that it's just too heavy to uh, warrant using it. Effectively, you just end up losing too much delta v, delta v to, to weight, and it's just not worth it. So I think Poodle is the only uh, vacuum engine that is worth using. The only reason why I could see someone wanting to include a vacuum engine on their SSTO is if you intend to do a orbital re refueling, then you could actually see some meaningful difference from including a vacuum engine. But even then, the rapier has 320 vacuum ISP, so it's not like the ISP is bad or anything. So I'd, if you don't want to go for a hydrogen SSTO, I just stick to a pure rapier design. However, if you want to build a really massive and a really capable SSTO, hydrogen is definitely the go-to. Now compared to KSP1, Hydrogen SSTOs are substantially more capable than the old NERV. The reason for that being is mostly the, the new Swerve engine. The Swerve has absolutely ridiculous ISP and it also has really good thrust. In addition to that, hydrogen is extremely low density. Now, at first, it was definitely a bit of a problem for me as fitting enough hydrogen tanks on an SSTO is kind of challenging and a lot of the SSTOs end up looking kind of ugly. They just look super fat, basically. But once I started experimenting with them more and kind of figured out how to do decently looking designs, I've definitely unlocked the uh, hydrogen potential. Basically, what you do is you include, for my testing, including only one swerve works best, and then you include whiplash engines for the atmospheric stage. Now, there is a bit of a departure from KSP1 and standard, uh, SSTO designs of old. There are a number of reasons why I chose the Whiplash over the Rapier. The first one being is that the Whiplash is a little bit lighter, so you gain a bit of uh, Delta V because of that. The Whiplash has a higher ISP, so you don't need to haul as much fuel uh, to escape Kerbin's atmosphere, and most importantly, the Whiplash has a higher thrust at low speeds, while still maintaining great thrust at high speeds. Now, the reason why the uh, low speed thrust is so important is because we want to lift as much hydrogen as possible off the ground. With rapiers, you would need excessive engines. Uh, to lift this thing off the ground, I would probably need 8 rapiers, maybe even more, which would increase the uh, dead weight immensely, since not only are rapiers heavier, I would need more of them. 
So realistically, based on my testing, every time I built a Hydrogen SSTO, whiplashes were a lot more eff efficient. Now with the Hydrogen, so far I've been able to uh, make some pretty insane SSTOs, and honestly I'm only scratching the surface. I've been able to make a uh, SSTO that's capable of lifting over 100 tons into LKO. This specific SSTO is a lathe SSTO designed to take 36 kerbals to lathe, and then come back to carbon with no refueling. I've been able to make an SSTO with over 10,000 of LKO Delta V. Honestly, the sky is the limit when it comes to hydrogen SSTOs. Now, I know I've said this before in the video, and uh, I'll say it again, but this is without doubt the single most important part. This is 99% uh, guaranteed to fix your SSTO and give it drastically more Delta V. Basically, to understand this mistake, we first need to understand how a SSTO consumes fuel. Basically, for the atmospheric stage, the jet engine consumes pure methane. But once we ascend past the atmosphere and we go into uh, either closed cycle mode on the rapiers or we fire up literally any other chemical engine, we start consuming oxidizer. Now, every single chemical engine in game consumes oxidizer at a uh, 1 to 4 ratio. Basically, one part methane. 4 parts oxidizer. Now here's the thing, the mistake that nearly everybody makes is they don't account for the methane that they consume while flying in the atmospheric stage. Here's the issue guys. Let's simulate a little flight. What we're doing here is we are flying and we are getting out of LKO currently. We're still flying in the atmosphere so the engines are only consuming methane. Now that we got out of the atmosphere, the engine starts to consume oxidizer as well. But, as you can see, we have an imbalance. Once all of the methane is consumed, we still have a lot of spare oxidizer. And because oxidizer burns at a rate of 1 to 4 to methane, we have a lot of spare oxidizer, which is a lot of dead mass. Effectively, what you're doing is, you're increasing your uh, SSTO's dry mass without even knowing it. To account for this mistake, we simply have to add a couple of dedicated methane tanks to account for the atmospheric stage. Ideally, you're looking to have a perfect 1 to 4 ratio of methane to oxidizer by the time you either switch to closed cycle mode on the rapier or activate your vacuum engines when leaving the atmosphere. Now I get that uh, adding up and dividing odd numbers is a little bit difficult, so what I like to do is, once I get into LKO, I simply expand all of my Delta V and check if I have uh, additional methane or additional oxidizer and then tune it from there. Now hydrogen SSTOs are much the same way, except that instead of managing a single fuel type, you're actually managing two fuels. But, as it turns out, managing two fuel types is actually a little bit more simple. Effectively, what you're doing is you're trying to expand all of your liquid fuel by the time you actually exit Kerbin's atmosphere, so you're not carrying any additional dead mass into the vacuum of space, and basically hurting your delta-v. Now, unfortunately, there is a pretty massive drag bug played in KSP2 at the moment, Every single part you see here, which are reaction wheels, inline remote guidance units, inline decouplers, fairings, and cargo bays are all bugged. They basically increase your drag massively, and if that wasn't bad enough, fairings and cargo bays actually don't shield anything inside of them from drag. But there might be some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the devs did actually address this specific bug in the forums, and they are actually working on fixing it, so hopefully it's fixed pretty soon. And if you absolutely have to use a uh, cargo bay right now, there is a pretty jank sort of fix that you can do. Basically, what you do is you open up the cargo bay, and on either side of the cargo bay, you simply cover up the nodes with an appropriately sized nose cone. Basically what you want to do is you want to pick up a nose cone and then try to match its node size to the cargo base node size. You want to use the uh, smallest nose cone that you can for this. Now this won't eliminate the cargo base drag, they will still uh, generate more drag than they should and they still won't shield anything inside of them, but it's a little bit of a fix and it's better than nothing. 
Now, the first thing, and probably the most important thing that you need to consider that we're going to be talking about is drag management. Now, why would you care about drag? Well, unlike a rocket, an SSTO uh, needs to be highly efficient in its atmospheric stage. The more drag you have, the more fuel you'll need to expend to uh, fight that drag, the more engines you'll need, and the lower your uh, LKO delta V is going to be by the time you uh, exit uh, Kerbin's atmosphere, or you might not even be able to exit at all if you have too much drag. In essence, optimizing your SSTO design is going to start off with uh, working on the atmospheric stage. Basically, the goal of your optimization is to uh, reduce the number of atmospheric engines to as little as possible, as all of those engines are just going to be dead weight once you're in the vacuum of space. As well, uh, and we can start doing that by reducing the aircraft's drag. First thing that you can do is reduce your rapier's drag. Now, if we mouse over the rapier, we can see that it has this little green node coming off the back. Now, KSP works a little bit unintuitively. Basically, the things that actually create drag are these little nodes. So leaving any nodes exposed is going to be increasing your drag quite a lot. To uh, uh, work around this, we can go into the uh, aerodynamic tab, take the smallest aerodynamic cone, stick it on the back of a rapier, and offset it a little bit into the engine. This effectively reduces uh, rapier's drag by removing the back node, and I also think that it makes it look a little bit cooler. The second step that we can do is optimizing our intakes. Now, unlike in KSP-1, the uh, shock cone intake isn't as universally used as it is in KSP-2. It is fantastic if you have more than uh, two rapiers, but if your craft includes uh, either one or two rapiers, it's actually more efficient to go for, the, uh, uh, for these elongated rectangular intakes. Basically, you want to have two of these intakes per rapier to uh, ensure a more or less optimal airflow. But Kerman, what if we want to use more than four rapiers, you might say? Well, don't worry guys, I got you covered on that. What you want to do is you want to come into the uh, aerodynamic section, you want to pick up one of these engine neckels. I have no idea what they're called or how to say it, but you want to pick up one of these. And then you take a shock cone and put it on the front of it. Now this configuration is going to be able to power approximately 8 rapiers easily and is going to be a lot more drag efficient than having two of these cones on either side of the craft. Uh, additionally what I like to do is take the nose cone and offset a little bit into the uh, whatever the intake is called to give it a, a pretty cool uh, uh, jet engine intake look, but that's completely up to you and it's purely visual. Now, once we have the number of engines uh, roughly selected and we've optimized our intakes, we can start focusing on the wing. Uh, now, the size of the wing is uh, gonna be quite varied and I can't exactly tell you how big of a wing you need for any given plane. It's a bit of a uh, feeling that you get once you build a couple of SSTOs or planes. Uh, but I can still give you a couple of tips on how to make the wing a bit more efficient. The first thing that we're going to be doing is mousing over the wing and clicking the little wrench icon. In here, we can see two very important settings, root thickness and tip thickness. Basically, it either increases or decreases our wing's thickness. Now, in KSP2, uh, wing thickness actually affects our uh, SSTO's performance a lot. Basically, a thick wing is going to be optimized for low speed flight, is going to create way more lift at low speeds, but it's also going to be creating a lot more drag. A thin wing is going to create very little lift at low speeds, but it's also going to be creating very little drag. Basically, when building an SSTO, you want to keep your uh, wing thickness pretty thin. On a super small SSTO like this one, you want to be uh, very close to zero on thickness. On a uh, larger SSTO, let's say up to about 100 tons, you probably don't want to go over 
about 0.06 and so on. Basically, the wing always stays pretty thin regardless of the SSTO size. Another little tip that I can give you is angling the wing. Now, why would we want to angle the wing? Like so. This is a bit, a bit extreme, but for demonstration purposes it'll have to do. Basically, uh, whenever the aircraft flies, it will naturally want to pitch up a little bit to maintain level flight. Uh, this happens because a wing, when it's perfectly in line with the airstream, doesn't actually generate lift. So, effectively, the wing always has to be pitched up a little bit. Uh, now, the issue is that if we don't angle the wing and leave it perfectly in line with the, um, with the airframe, basically we're presenting a much bigger profile to the airstream and the airframe itself is going to generate substantially more drag. But, if we simply angle the wing up, as we can see now, now only the wing is presenting a bigger profile and the airframe itself is perfectly in, the, in line with the airstream and is generating substantially lower drag. Now in the perfect world, you effectively want your angle of attack to be zero throughout your entire flight, but that's probably not gonna happen, so basically just uh, aim for, uh, I would say about uh, one to half a degree, ideally. Now on SSTO, this light and this powerful, you don't really need that much uh, wing tilt. Honestly, the wing tilt isn't gonna make that much of a difference, maybe a 1-2% to uh, in Delta V and LKO. But once you start doing bigger SSTOs, it actually makes a big difference and you might need a fairly aggressive wing tilt, like you can see on this thing. The wing is tilted quite a lot, probably as much as 10 degrees. If we were to angle the aircraft and look at it from the front, we can see that the profile is quite huge if we wouldn't angle the wing, but once the wing is angled, we can present a much lower profile and re reduce our drag substantially. Now this thing basically doesn't even make it to LKO without angled wings, but with angled wings this thing has about 5000 uh, meters a second of delta V in LKO. Another thing that I highly recommend you do uh, every single time you build an airframe is effectively splitting your control surfaces. Now sadly, uh, KSP doesn't have the functionality to uh, have multiple control surfaces on a single wing. So to get around it, what we're going to be doing is effectively placing an additional smaller wing on the tip of our main wing. Now why would you want to do this? Well, it mostly comes down to how SAS works. Unfortunately, KSP2 SAS isn't very good right now, and it seriously struggles with the def wobble. I'm sure that anyone, anyone that has tried to build either a plane or an SSTO in KSP2 has seen it. To effectively eliminate it, we can split our control surfaces so that the outborn wing is only doing roll, and the inborn wing is only doing pitch control. This will effectively give SAS substantially lower authority over the, the roll axis, and it will reduce the likelihood of SAS freaking out substantially. If SAS is still freaking out, what you can do is basically right click the wing, go into advanced controls, and reduce its authority limit. That'll give SAS even less authority over the uh, roll axis and it will basically reduce the likelihood of your plane wiggling itself to death. Another thing that I recommend you guys do on every single plane or SSTO is effectively angling the wing slightly upwards. Now personally I like to do a bit of a V-shaped design with two wing pieces but you can just as easily do it with a single wing as you can see here. Just like so. Basically what this does is uh, give the wing a little bit of authority in the uh, lateral and vertical axis, giving the aircraft a little bit more stability overall. You also want to be mindful of where your wing is in relation to your center of mass. You can easily check this by going into the blueprint view, and at the, at the bottom center you can activate the center of mass indication and center of lift indication. 
Ideally, you want your center of lift to be slightly behind your center of mass. However, you do need to be mindful of uh, where your center of mass is both with the tanks full and the tanks empty. If we empty one of the hydrogen tanks at the front and one of the methane tanks, we can see that the center of mass we can see that the center of mass shifts and uh, this thing is going to be barely barely controllable with only the front three fuel tanks drained. Now unfortunately there's no way to uh, show both dry and wet center of mass at the same time so you'll basically just have to uh, manually empty and fill, fill your tanks to check it. And now that you have your wings, your engines, your fuel tanks and your intakes all properly set up and optimized, it's time to hit the last thing on the list and optimize our suspension. Now ideally you want your re rear landing gears to be just behind the center of mass and you also want your rear landing gears to be a little bit higher up than the, than the front landing gears so that the aircraft is slightly pitched up on the runway to make it a little bit easier to take off. Now unfortunately uh, stock suspension in KSP is kind of cursed. Uh, both landing legs, landing gears and uh, rover wheels all have the same issues. So basically whenever you use any of those parts I highly recommend to always go into the settings and set them up yourself. Basically what we're gonna be doing is starting off with the rear landing gears we are going to be disabling steering on the rear. We're also going to go into uh, suspension, disable auto suspension, and max out both spring strength and dampening strength. Then we're going to go into the front gear. We are going to be uh, leaving steering on for the front. We're going to go into auto suspension, disable it, and once again max out both spring and dampening strength. Now, if you're still having issues with your aircraft randomly wearing off course or uh, just randomly drifting, I would recommend going into auto friction control, disabling it, setting it to about 0.1 for the front and anywhere from 0.2 to about 0.4 on the rear. Now, hopefully armed with all of these little tips and tricks, you'll be able to make your SSTO a lot more efficient and make it fly a lot further, as well as lift a lot more. I did have a lot more little tips to uh, to share, but given that the video was already over 20 minutes long, I felt like mostly just sticking to the basics and maybe saving some future tips for another video. If I did miss anything, you guys can let me know in the comments and I'll be uh, happy to include it in either future videos or maybe make a follow-up. But anyway, that's the video guys. Uh, for those that stuck this long, thank you a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one.